the main EA. Well, but it's more than the main EA. I mean, it's truly. Okay, right. We talked about that. And Council Member Osborne, uh, the nice part about this plan is it, you know, it obviously takes us to build out, and we can absolutely look at the different parks because um, there are also um, people with special needs that can again be integrated. Uh, like Challenger Baseball does just need, you know, a baseball field, so we can do certain things. And you can actually, with this many parks, you could either make one, you know, completely, you know, a special needs park, or you can have different areas throughout the city, so they, they wouldn't have to drive necessarily to one park. So absolutely. Right, that park's not included right now because again, um, it, it has went from different sizes, um, and again, that theme for that park hasn't quite been picked out, but yet, but it has been talking about it being more passive because of the neighborhoods being there, and you've got the athletic lighting for fields. It's not something that might be compatible with the neighborhoods, um, so that might be more of again like a passive park um, that we've been discussed again with maybe some of that open space, the picnic, the amphitheater, but no design has been done for that. Absolutely. That was, but my thought was that some of the parks that are our neighborhood parks that are within Wildfire Ranch and um, or Estrella Vista, some of those parks that are having terrible ceviche problems, maybe we reroute some of the active things that we do with it to, to help it rather than um, having blue grass. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's, it's basketball courts rather than, you know. So we're <coughs> Uh, right now, this was not included in the plan. Um, right, that will, yeah, that will help us bring up our acreage um, per thousand, um, and that will help bring up that community park acreage. Now, granted, we do have it about ten and a half months, so we have to kind of prorate. We take the total acreage and we'll prorate um, for you know the ten and a half months that we do get to use it um, and again that's definitely for the athletic that will serve the athletic population so it can help with the leagues and sports and organized um, but again it wouldn't be the picnic area it's not the indoor facility um, and obviously being the sports complex it, it's it's maintained at a higher level so we do need to be careful what we do put there you don't want to have too much overuse on those fields um, Would you like us to define that for you, Councilmember Lord? What we consider active recreation um, is basically like what you have at the Goodyear Community Park where you have fields and where there's organized recreational activities, the special events, concerts. Passive will be um, lights. lights, very important. When I talk lights, we're talking field lights. Sight lighting is just, that's common. You've got to put that almost everywhere. You'll have sight lights. Passive recreation is more of like your picnic areas, playgrounds, um, some of your sport courts where it's more of like a drop-in feel. So that's what we consider when you talk about um, active recreation is more of a programmed aspect. Passive recreation is more of a drop-in. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes sense that it would be an area for the younger people to be while their parents are off doing whatever the afternoon 
It's more of like a gathering place, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But anyway, those two things, I just want to bring those two things up because I think it's important that we think about those two things. And now I saw a notation in here that in your hand up there. You said the dog park wasn't big enough. Is that true? That that was the instance you got to show the people. Go ahead. I think when we were talking to the uh, focus group and the public, that was their comment at that time. And we have done um, studies on dog parks over the last two years, and 
The issue on dog parks, as everyone knows, is maintaining the turf area to a sustainable level. And so what we've been able to find is that the minimum size that really works for sustaining the turf surface is a minimum of two acres and having separate cells that you can rotate usage on that. I don't know how large it is. Uh, the entire park itself is three, so it's split. The passive side is uh, smaller than the active side. Uh, what has helped is that we do have a smaller dog park over at the Goodyear Community Park where uh, we went ahead and when we put the permanent outfill fences in, we did put, and it's a very small dog park, but at least it's the second one in the city. Um, and if you do look uh, within that plan, we do plan on putting many more dog parks in a lot of the rest of the community parks as well. We know that that's... that's um, very popular with uh, the residents. And Councilmember Cavalier, oh, okay. Okay. Just quickly, those teams that are from that area have been on the recreational roundtable. Just so you know, because on that recreational roundtable, they have every opportunity to make complaints, to make suggestions, and they all came together and made concessions Okay, right. uh, we do have, again, the total cost for build out, but not to 2020. So, again, we can get you the 2020. Oh, that. <laughs> what do we have? What is it, 345? Where is it? We're coming. We don't have a total, but it's per park, so we'd have to add up each one. I think it was 345. I think I added it up. Will you? Yeah, I did. Okay, do you have? Yeah, where did you? Yeah, no, we did. I think so all of that would have to be added up. Councilmember Antoniak, we will get that information to you. Um, when I did the calculations uh, for build out, it's about three hundred and forty-five million by the time you build out. That's why it's an implementation process. It's an implementation process that that doesn't happen overnight.
No. Um, supervisors who would like to unload that part because they can't handle it. They yeah. just can't do it. Well, they are doing it well. And they are. They would acknowledge that it is as a beautiful part of this valley and it is not set up. We can change that. And other, you know, there's another government that owns a significant economic part of our city. And we can consider doing the same with them. Uh, this, is, this is a time to take advantage of the economy. And there's some BLM land. Yeah. I'm not saying there's BLM land within that city park. I'll tell you personally. Um, but there, yeah. there, I don't want to out there. But there's, you know, there is another significant part of land owned by another government that we could use. And uh, I think that uh, this is, this with the park, with this, this is the opportunity to look at that. Because do we have the courage and the financial But then there's a massive trail trail system that is, is quite well maintained in terms of both bike and pedestrian and, and that sort of thing. So from 
an operation standpoint, just initially, it kind of goes, I go, hmm, I don't even think to myself, gosh, I'd almost, if, if it's an operation and maintenance thing versus struggling over who owns it, I'd almost like to see us approach, uh, whether it's through an ownership type of opportunity or not. And I said, I think I'd pay five bucks to go down that night each time. And if it's a matter of the fields are poorly maintained and we get some field access out of it, maybe we do some programming out of it and we add in to the L&M and the future resident drives out, shows the driver's license, says good year, or the water bill says good year, and they get free admission to a 14,000 acre asset. So you're saying more of a part space, you know, an ITA approach may be. Well, I, I'm not saying anything. I'm just yeah, saying that we exactly need to look at it. Yeah, we need to find but, uh, but and different those kind of options need to be brought back to us more than just purchasing it. We need to talk. I didn't say you that. Think purchasing now. In this yeah. economy, you need to think purchasing. Because yeah. the opportunity is going to come again. I don't disagree. But no, that's purchasing was what I said. I know you did. I'm saying that. Yeah. To look at the option. Yeah. Okay. And we don't, don't even need to discuss it now. But I think what I would like is for us to agree do we want the staff to staff it starting next year to look at the financial and the safety issues associated with us owning or taking a greater role in managing that part. Off the top of my head, I love to own it. I think it's a thing to do, but I don't know. I can't prove that. Okay, hey guys, that $350 million did not include the price of land. Just thought I'd put that in there. The $350 million. That's just the amenities. That's just the amenities. That is not including the land. So I just wanted to What about the not affordable? Talk to RJ.
Well, we need to do it. Or there's no reason. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Space bar or the forward. Thank you. No, because the agenda for the meeting states that the meeting starts immediately following this. It doesn't say it starts at 6. Correct, bro? Yeah. We're okay. It doesn't mean we've got a lot of time. No, sir. No, sir. And in order to save money, we did not bring any dinner to All right. All right. Thank you, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, it is uh, with great pleasure that I present tonight our CompStat program. Um, CompStat is uh, a, an accountability program. It is a problem-solving program. It is uh, a crime reduction program. It is a strategy that looks at all elements of, of crime and analyzes them as to why they are that way. And um, we started this program uh, seven months ago. Um, it was uh, uh, something that I had wanted to do for many, many years, but we just we lacked the management structures, and we also lacked the ability to have our data analyzed properly. Uh, we are now in a position to do that, and we kicked it off uh, last April, um, and uh, it's been going very well, and we get better at it every month. So, uh, what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, and, and again in brief, what is CompStat? Uh, the principles, the four guiding tenets of, of CompStat, what our process is internally for getting this crime data out. Um, we look at our actual program, our workload indicators, uh, the actual crime analysis, the intelligence analysis, and if we think about crime analysis as locations, times of days, and those things, we look at intelligence and anal uh, analysis as human beings or, or crime offenders. Um, we look at significant developments in, in, uh, as it pertains to crime. Uh, also, uh, the outcomes, the accountability that it increases, the creativity to solving problems, and uh, how it is results-oriented. Um, we'll also end with what are the benefits that we've seen thus far. So what is CompStat? It's uh, actually a, a term for comparative or computerized statistics. Um, was developed by the New York Police Department. Uh, William Bratton, uh, who is now the chief of the LAPD, uh, started it in 1994. He was the commissioner of the NYPD then, um, with some outstanding results. Uh, wrote some books about this. A uh, lot of study has been done since then. A lot of agencies are doing this. We went to, we found out Mesa PD was doing it. They opened their doors to us. We attended uh, probably about 10 meetings that they had so that we could find out what we needed to do, how it would work best in our city. Uh, we also visited Scottsdale PD to help us get this up and going. But it's a crime reduction strategy, as I've said, creative problem solving, collaboration department-wide, which is the key, department-wide. It's accountability management, assigns responsibility to the lowest levels of the organization. So we're no longer just complaining about taking reports, we're actually coming up with reasons of why we're taking these reports and how do we reduce that. We use current data to track crime trends, and again, proactive rather than reactive. Uh, the principles of CompStat. These are the four guiding tenets of CompStat. Accurate and timely intelligence. We need to have that. Crime and intelligence and analysis, uh, analysis. Why is that important? Well, we need the accuracy of data. If I can just give you a quick brief example. If an officer goes to a call 
and it's a car in a parking lot. The window's smashed in. The steering column's broken out. Um, and it's obviously that someone attempted to steal that vehicle and couldn't take it for one reason or another, uh, but then couldn't start it, but they decided to steal the stereo. So an officer gets there, and that officer may decide that it's a attempted stolen vehicle or it's a burglary from a motor vehicle. We need to know what that is, so looking at the, through the analysis at that type of a, a scenario, we can then develop protocols and procedures internally to say, when we have this situation, we're going to classify it as this. Why? Because of data integrity, and we want to make sure we're looking at, at analyzed data, not raw data. Very important to do that. Uh, number two, effective tactics. How do we address these situations? Um, rapid deployment of resources. This is one that is very critical, and I want to thank the council for last year uh, giving us our street crimes unit. This is that rapid deployment uh, squad that we allow. When we look at those hot spots, we can put them, and there's flexibility built in there. We can put them on those problems, and uh, uh, we can either uh, eliminate the crime there, we can displace, or we can disrupt the crime from going on in those areas. And then number four, relentless follow-up and assessment. Um, again, now that we have the management structure, this is largely falling on our lieutenants uh, for that creative problem solving. They in turn meet and they meet with their sergeants, meet with officers. They also look at our task forces. Uh, what resources can they bring in? Is it street crimes? Is it SWAT? Uh, do we need surveillance? What is the resource we need to address crime in those areas? They bring that solution to us and then they give us next month's strategy for the next 30 days. What we do is we hold a meeting once a month, uh, previous month's data, and we look at three-month trend data. Why? Because we want to see if things are going in the same way. Uh, it's collected, analyzed, and mapped. Uh, the workload review, the red flag indicators, that was something we added, red flag indicators. Is there a problem that we need to be aware of? Rather than it finding out some other mechanism, we're looking at it every 30 days. So if there is a problem, it's only 30 days old. Uh, we are able to look at uh, calls for service, which is our primary workload indicator. We also look at it by squads. Officer initiated, we look at what comes in by telephone and what comes in by 911. Those are very important indicators of where those calls and those calls for service are coming from. And most importantly, we want to look at response time reviews. We want to make sure we're providing a quality service to our citizens. That's why that's so important to us. Um, crime data is presented, first of all, in patrol areas. And we look at the city in our beach structures, and we have uh, lieutenants responsible for specific areas. <clears throat> Excuse me, whether they work in that area all the time or not, they are responsible for the crime that goes on there. They are responsible for looking at that data, looking at how it's mapped out, where are hot spots, and coming up with those strategies. Uh, it's categorized by crime type. And again, we even look at quality of life concerns, graffiti cases. We look at immigration cases. We look at all of those types of things that while they may not be the most significant crime, they are certainly crime that bothers people or police involvements that bother people. It's further analyzed by time of day and day of the week. We need to know where to put those resources that we have uh, on, those, on those hot spots. Time of day and day of week is extremely important. We look at burglaries, and they're categorized in three different ways. We look at burglaries from motor vehicles, burglaries from residential, and burglaries from commercial to see, again, where those resources are and what's the most popular. Also important in the trending. Um, thefts, we categorize that in a, in a few different ways as well. Uh, we look at retail theft, shopliftings, uh, theft of motor vehicles, and residential theft. Again, when we're analyzing crime, we want to know specifically what type of theft we're talking about. Trend analysis is performed is the first step, and that tells us what are we seeing, when are we seeing it, and where are we seeing it. Need to know those things. Hot spots and high crime densities. Did I just go too far? Wow, okay. Maybe I banged the table too hard. Or something. Uh, data comparison of the previous month. And the current month, we look at last month, we look at this month. We do an overlay and say, what's different and why? And if it, it, why is crime increased? Not a very comfortable position for those lieutenants to be in, answering why crime's increased in their areas. If they follow their 30-day previous commitment to strategy, it should not be higher. It may di be displaced, 
we may have pushed it somewhere else, but it better not be the same hot spot two months in a row. Uh, we look for increases and decreases. We attempt to, an we attempt to answer the why. Uh, crime movement is occurring is, 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 is also important for us to know. We look at certain areas, green belts we're seeing as, as an area where they're being common. Why? Because it's very difficult to patrol there. Why? Because it's, they're not visible to anybody in those areas. So uh, we look at those and try to address that and put resources on those areas. Um, we review our resource deployments. Are they needed? We look at uh, several different strategies. Obviously one and the most high profile, the most visible, is our street crimes unit. We look at our task force people, our narcotics task force, our gang task force, our auto theft task force. We get great resources from having one officer assigned to those task forces. Um, intensive patrols, meaning we're doing a saturation of certain areas, high visibility, to see if we can displace and disrupt crime from those areas. Um, obviously arrests we look at, very important in indicator for addressing crime. And then we also have a zero a tolerance approach. Um, what this says up there is FI everyone, and FI is a field interview. If we see people walking around in certain areas, we stop and just talk to them, ask them their name, what they're doing, where do they live. Um, helps us a lot. If it's a person who's walking in the neighborhood, oftentimes they appreciate that, knowing that the police are out there and talking to people. If they have uh, uh, crime on their mind and they're, and they're up to no good, uh, they might not want to come back. They may not have done anything yet but they know that we've talked to them, we've identified them as being in the area, they're less likely to commit a crime in our city. We also want to make sure that we're increasing accountability with that too. Why? Because we have the resources. If you're not using the resources to lower crime, then there's a problem. Specialized unit update as, as from a monthly standpoint. Um, and we want to know what their significant occurrences are. We want to know what goes on with traffic. We want to know where, where the crash data is happening, where are our accidents the last 30 days. We look at the last few months, where are they? If they're in the same place, we say you're not doing enough, we need to go and address those things. We basically look at crash data like hotspots of crime. Um, we also look at citation type. Are they doing speeding tickets in this area? Are they running stop signs? Is it uh, uh, unsafe lane changing? What is the type of, of citation in those areas? that is addressing the, the crash data, the, the accidents from occurring. We look at our school resource officers. We're getting a lot of calls for service out of our schools. Very important that we know what type of, of cases are going on. Now it's not uncommon for them to get a hold of a uh, gang task force to help them identify either some graffiti or some behaviors, um, the drug, the narcotics task force, and uh, even the auto theft task force for our high schools. So those resources are available to everyone. They don't have to be a lieutenant requesting it. It can be that frontline officer requesting those resources. Um, obviously our, our three task forces I just spoke about give us an update of their most significant things. Um, we look at all significant cases throughout that last 30 days. Uh, we look at uh, significant sentences for suspects, significant arrests, high profile arrests. And we also look at Goodyear's Most Wanted. We used to call it the 10 Most Wanted, but our street crimes unit was so successful. In the first 30 days, they arrested nine people off that list. So we're going to get to that a little bit later about that, the Most Wanted. We still have people we want out there. Um, what we look at is our workload indicators calls for service. And this, this goes back to 2005. And uh, it goes from uh, January through December, left to right. And I know that's kind of hard to read there, but uh, uh, something happened to us in uh, August of this past year where we hit 6,069 calls. We had never reached 6,000 calls for service in a month before. Um, again, we try to answer that call, that, that why. What is the origin of these calls? We looked at high activities of officer-initiated service for that. Um, which is important. Our officers are out there being active. Again, that is going to address crime issues. So don't let the number scare you necessarily. It's very active, but a lot of it is being done and initiated by our police officers. So we looked at the next month, September. Well, we did it again. We broke 7,000, 7,308 calls for service that month. Um, back down in October to 6,700, and then uh, in November we were 6,900. So some significant activities for our police officers out there. The why? 
Well, a lot of it is uh, increased call volumes. Uh, theft has increased, certainly. Um, it uh, looks like we do have an increase in self-initiated activity from our officers, especially our night shift people. When uh, calls for service coming into our call center are low, their activities are very high still. So we're out there trying to address crime all the time. So that the calls for service don't see that dip like we used to, it remains high throughout the 24-hour period. It's Halloween. Is it the percentage of type of calls from July to, say, September, even though you see it jump to close to 7,300 or just over 7,300 from, say, 5,000 mm -hmm. calls in July? Is the type of call the same percentage, i.e. the 25% self-initiated, 25% property crime, 25% civil traffic? We, we didn't see, yes, that, that's correct. We didn't see big jumps in those types of crime, or the, or the percentages. Okay. The volumes went up, okay. if that makes sense. So the volume went up, but the percentages, the percentages of types of crimes trended the same. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Not exactly, but yes, uh, in the ballpark, or, yeah, yeah. Um, so we look at those as, a, as, a, as an, a very, being very important. Now, here's some red flag in indicators. Now, I show you this one because this is an actual... Uh, indicator of our response times. And I want to point out uh, to beat four, which is uh, an area for priority one calls, which is an absolute emergency. Priority two would be an urgent call. Priority three would be uh, uh, just a report call for service. And a priority four is a low priority call for service. Uh, but looking at area four, our, our goal for these is seven minutes on a priority one. And we were grossly over that. We found this out by looking at this data. Beat four? on that column, nine minutes, seven seconds. Oh, where? Oh, where? <laughs> yeah, it's up there. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's a stray mountain ranch. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's my area. just keep your ears up, eyes open. There. Yeah, yeah. We're well, and, and, and this is why we, we point this out, and this is one of the successes of, of CompStat, is it allows us to look at this data, analyze this data. And we look at this and we say, okay, our overall average is four minutes and 59 seconds for priority one. Okay, we're within that seven-minute range. However, what's going on in area four? And we looked at all the calls that we were seeing for that area. We were seeing that that officer is coming out of that patrol area to back up other officers in other beat areas. So the question now, the enlightened question to the lieutenants is, how do we fix that? How do we keep an officer down there to keep those response times down? Well... Uh, that was June of 08, that so this, number. This graphic is June of 08? Correct. That's June of 08. And uh, looking at last month, um, that patrol area for there, and we've steadily improved on this. There was a steady improvement. We lowered it by almost half after the first month. Correct. So we've improved it in a lot of areas. We need to work on area three where John and I live, but uh, that's, uh, well, that's because you're there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not responding to calls, that's for sure, at night. Um, but uh, it is a significant improvement. And through those red flag indicators, we're identifying the problem before it becomes a, a real problem for us. And so if we can lower those averages and keep those officers in their beats by implementing strategies, and they're not all the same strategies for these. Um, and that's the beauty of CompStat. It, it, it promotes that creativity, but it's re results-oriented. And if we're achieving those results, we encourage that creativity. Sure. And, and we have. But I think the important thing to stress there too, Rob, is that uh, in that one that you're referring to, 
there was a victim arrested, I mean, a, a perpetrator arrested within three minutes. Right, which is, which is fantastic. But, you know, as that one heightened, there were, you know, other people in the area, and the community gets, once the community gets talking, you're out done. So well, it is a success. It's a success sure. that we, we sure. ought yeah. to be following up with those specific folks. That have well, it gets so around. And, and, and we have. Fast. And we have. Good. We have. Um, we have actually done a presentation. Right. And we did talk about this specific issue, too. So. Thank you. And the visibility has increased of officers, and that's another important thing. I don't know that they're interested in any statistics, but they are interested in the fact that crime has gone down in that area. And, yeah, they need to, maybe they need to some uh, feedback on this. I don't know. I'll be there on the 15th of January. I would be, I, I mean, they may not be interested in the statistics, but when we had that house burned down before we had a fire station, a couple of them, everybody knew the minute response time it was. Oh, down sure. The hill, Absolutely. The Absolutely. Oh, sure. But we've made significant improvements there from problem identification and looking at those and, uh, making those a new priority. To lower that overall average to 3 minutes 47 seconds citywide is pretty impressive. Now, this is a sample of, of a crime map, and I'm sorry you can't see it real well, but there's actually little black dots on that map. And what, what that does is that shows us, and we can outline our beat areas right over on, on an overlay of those maps, and we can say what crimes happen. We can look at, uh, say, for example, auto theft, where are auto theft, autos being stolen from. Uh, we can look at burglaries, where are they occurring from? We look at retail theft, where is that occurring from? And that way it allows us to first put resources on those, but then in 30 days we look at those again and we do an overlayment, and now you see the red dots, and if the red dots were where the black dots were last month, there's a problem. You know, we want to see at least a movement of that crime because of the activities and the presence that we're putting in those areas. That's hugely important to us in this program. So we want to see those things change. Now, there are some issues, some, some areas, where you're always going to see a higher frequency of certain types of crime. For example, large retail centers. And uh, I know Harry's back there, probably doesn't want me to say this, but uh, when you have large concentrations of vehicles that are fresh every two to four hours, um, and a, you're a criminal who steals from cars or steals cars, you're going to go to those areas. So we're going to have those kinds of dots somewhere. Now, what we want to see is a less higher number of those dots month to month, and at least a displacement of those. And, and it's important to remember, too, that about 68 percent of the people we arrest in our city don't live here. So if we can displace that crime out of our city limits, that's a good thing, too. I'm not saying where anybody's from. <laughs> Uh, this is a, what a significant case update looks like. You may have seen these, uh, but someone was arrested in that power outage. Uh, it took us a year to get this guy. Um, he's going to be sentenced. Uh, he's looking at several years because he's got priors. Um, we did an outreach, and uh, actually that nightmare we talked about this and handed out flyers. We are going to arrange for several residents down there to come to the sentencing, speak directly to the judge. If they can't be there, write letters. Um, to talk about the inconvenience of having lost power for those many hours. A lot of people lost food. A lot of people couldn't go into their house. It was summertime. They had no power. They had to check into hotels. They were financially burdened by this person's action. You know, uh, over a thousand homes were without power for multiple hours. So this is a significant arrest. This is a significant case update. These are the things we look at that. Uh, sen sentencing is June 30th. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, January 30th, January 30th. Where did he live? Where did he live? Uh, Rainbow Valley area. Where? Rainbow Valley area. County? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. No. And then we go over our most wanted. This is our last month's most wanted. This does appear on our, on our website, uh, city website and the police department. Um, it's also going out to the Protect Your Business uh, program site. And uh, what we want to do is show... Uh, these photos out there so if our business owners or people can recognize them give us a clue to where they are um, you can see we've got some assault DV we've got vehicle burglar and a fraud and forgery suspect that we're looking for right now 
there's always people on here. There's always uh, new faces to be put up here, but uh, we are happy to hunt them down. No, sir. No, sir. And some of them, that's why it's difficult to find them. We don't have good addresses on them. We know they're a suspect. We know about them. Um, we may not have a good work address. But uh, if we can get a good lead, we'll put the street crimes unit on it, and they are, have been very successful in apprehending these folks. Uh, outcomes, again, uh, accountability. It's what it's about. We are accountable for the crime in our city. We are the police department here, and, and people look to us to uh, address those issues. Mid-level managers, lieutenants, have the greatest burden on them for this program. Uh, provides a great deal of freedom to creatively deploy resources to those hotspots, but with that freedom comes more accountability. If you not, don't do it right, you may have to answer for that. But uh, we need to demonstrate effectiveness. And it's, it's not always an efficiencies issue, unfortunately. It's an effectiveness issue. Um, but there's an expectation to describe the deployment and the tactical plans of action. I asked them point blank at the meetings, what is the plan for the next 30 days? What resources have you used? Um, and it's, it's nice to see us start after seven months really starting to understand the, the, the value and the importance of this program. And the outcomes, again, results-oriented. It requires everybody working together. Patrol's in the room when we have these meetings. The detectives are in there. The task force detectives are in there. SWAT's in there. Everybody's in there. We're all talking about this, and everybody provides solutions. Quick example, we have our officer who's assigned to the Arizona uh, Counterterrorism Information Center. We were looking for a guy on our most wanted list, our fraud forgery guy. We understood that he's related to someone who gets plane tickets for him regularly. So that's where we're going to go look for him. Our, our person from the ACTIC Center said, hey, give me his name. I can flag him with the FAA. This guy flies anywhere on any airline at any time. We'll know when he buys a ticket. And then we go down to the airport and we can apprehend them there or I'll ask Phoenix to help us with that. By having these people in the room now talking month to month, we're better aware of our resources. Our communication has improved tremendously. And we know every 30 days we're going to be coming across these opportunities. Did you say you started this in June? When did you uh, um, actually, we started the street crimes unit in June. We started this uh, April. Okay. April. Okay. April. Okay. Correct. And then the benefits, low cost implementation. We are using our existing staff. We're using our existing beach structures. Um, it formalizes our management structure. And uh, certainly the authority, this was a matrix recommendation. And we knew that this program fit into with what their recommendations were. It approves cross-divisional information sharing. Um, we even have our civilian component in our department active in this and accountable for some elements of crime prevention. Uh, it increases crime and issues awareness throughout our organization. So it, it, it serves a, a, a huge purpose for us. And again, benefits, it makes everybody accountable for crime reduction. No longer will we allow people to complain about the workload and those things. Now you talk about how we address crime. And uh, we do a monthly review of all critical performance here. Um, it's going on people's performance appraisals if they're not doing a good job or if they are doing a good job. So there is a lot of pressure on them. Um, it helps identify issues for improvement, certainly our data integrity, also training issues. What do we need to be looking at? What do we need to be telling the public? And bottom line, it reduces crime. There's an invitation to all of you, uh, the second Thursday of every month, to attend a CompStat meeting, a full meeting takes about two hours. Start at 9 a.m., um, second Thursday of every month. Uh, we'd love to have you. Never more than three. Never more than three. <laughs> no, well, we could post it, I suppose. Really? We could. We could make accommodation for that. I don't know if you want to, but uh, or you could come one at a time. Yeah, I don't think you want to. But uh, we'd open it up to the council, council assistants, um, any analysts in the city. Well, and if they wanted to come, if they wanted to come, uh, they, they're, they're welcome as well. Uh, uh, we'd rather know who's coming to the dance yes. because it should not be. It, we, we have a pretty crowded room, quite honestly. So, uh, yeah, we, if we could know in advance, if you get RSVP uh, to us, uh, we can make sure that that happens. And if you want to work through, through your uh, assistants, uh, uh, Parrish and Betsy, um, they'll do a great job. 
and uh, also any department heads, we'd like to welcome them for a meeting too, uh, to see what we're doing there. Um, that's the conclusion. Went through that very fast, uh, but uh, any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's uh, it's the uh, CompStat team that's here. Uh, uh, Ralph McLaughlin, John Rowan, and of course Susan Petty uh, that, that really kind of uh, make sure all the parts are together uh, that second Thursday and getting the information out so we can look at the data before we have the meeting and so we can answer our questions, make sure we understand what that data means so that uh, um, we can get through it and, and again improve strategies. Well, the attitude of the people who live in Australia have really changed. I mean, it's more positive toward police and fire now than it ever was. Excellent. And, uh, of course, a lot of that with uh, our communications officer always dropping in Friday mornings, it helps a lot. Sure. That's great. John comes in and uh, it really helps a lot, just his presence there. Uh, the fact that uh, he, and he lives there. But uh, the people appreciate that. And they have seen an improvement in police activity up there and what it's done. And that's, uh, you're, you won't get an argument from anyone up there now. Thank it's, you. It's been all positive. Thank you. You know, I think the thing that really shows the citizens is uh, your better use of your resources. Uh, all right. Everybody is, is um, you're pulling it together uh, rather than just saying, okay, we have to add this, add that. But let's use our resources to the ultimate degree. And that's what you're doing in this ComStat. Correct. It's, uh, it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Right, right. <laughs> increase your, but decrease your response time by 200% or whatever it was from nine minutes to three minutes is just it's a tremendous achievement yeah. not right. to be uh, undersold. Well, and that's in the face of the uh, uh, calls for service going up 7,000. Yeah. Correct, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, having been in somewhat of Susan's shoes back early in my career, doing the statistics and putting these things together, it can take months, if not years, to oh, get sure. that to happen. And so it's, uh, it's exciting to see that. What point? the statistics and, and seeing this, um, it seems to me there'd be an opportunity for perhaps increased citizen engagement through technology, asking our residents to sign up on an email database or, or uh, you know, through some sort of technology that, you know, crimes of opportunity, which are very hard to prevent, open vehicles, you know, right. stealing things from the front yard, uh, you know, that sort of thing. You're going to, I imagine even through this, you've had a hard time policing that effort, but if you saw those Kind of like what we did with the businesses. Kind of what Correct. we did with the businesses on right. the residence side. Sure. Um, I don't know if that's something that you all have given thought to. It seems like it might be a low cost, you know, easy endeavor given your experience on the business side. Right. The, and, and that's a good point. Uh, looking at what was done with the businesses, Councilmember Osborne and John Rowan got the Protect Your Business program up and going. It, uh, it really has worked very well for us. Getting data out to, you know, in, in just one email. <laughs> well, they got to sign up. Got to sign up. But, but yeah, that's that. That is it is important, and it's a constant reminder on those crime prevention tips and looking at that. Every time we have a victim of a crime, there's always something that we've stressed that wasn't adhered to or for, was forgotten about. You know, they forgot to lock the gate or you know garage door or something. Um, so it's always it's a constant. Getting block watch going though, and having people now watching out for others as well as their own is an important feature too. So, we have block right. watches taking, everywhere up there. Now. Sure. I think they're taking personal responsibility sure. to help the help of this. Absolutely. Yeah. Another plus is the fact that this police department has a program where if you leave town, call the police department and tell them when you're leaving and what is the house, what condition the house is in, do you have an alarm system, all this. And a policeman will, an officer will go up. Correct. I understand on every shift, right? Sure. Go up and uh, walk around your house and, and right. check it out. And with our advent of our volunteers, um, with doing some parking citations, they actually recovered a stolen vehicle um, the other day. Yeah, uh, this weekend. So, parking lots, parking lots, and residential streets. And uh, so it, there are more eyes and ears out there for us. So. And they sure as heck are giving a lot of 
they're giving a lot of tickets out. Right? <laughs> That's right. If we go at 35 on the motion, is that okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Appreciate it. Good job.